All right, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Today we're talking about venting do's and don'ts. And really before we launch into the presentation there, um, I really want to just the important part of venting right now is there's some changes to the code here in Massachusetts as to what type of vent product you can use. And it's really making sure that you're starting with the right, whether it's an appliance adapter, whether you're using a glued joint, whatever it is, but starting with the right fitting is important. So I have right here a Giannone style heat exchanger. Whatever you're using for venting material, this requires an adapter, whether it's a PVC, CPVC style product, requires an adapter. Whether it's a polypropylene product, it's going to require an adapter as well. Just make sure you're using the appropriate adapter when you start. This is another style product over here. It's got a slightly different adapter on it. And again, it's gonna require an adapter to start. So always make sure you start with the correct appliance adapter. If you are gluing, um, make sure that you've got the appropriate glues. Um, right now there's, I think we have two glued options here in the Commonwealth coming up. Both are gonna use different uh, cements. So definitely make sure that you've got the right product. All right, so with that being said, we're gonna jump into some of the things about venting that people are running into. One of the things that tends to, to snag people is assuming that two boilers, two furnaces, two water heaters, whatever they are, that they vent the same. It really comes down to what are the manufacturer's installation instructions. When you're using a plastic vent system, the code puts the onus back to the manufacturer for how that goes in. So what does that mean? That means if I have two boiler manufacturers that use the exact same heat exchanger, but they test differently, you, their directions may be different. The terminations could be different, the lengths, whatever. So you have to follow that. When you move over to a vent system, whether you're using a polypropylene type vent system, or you're using a stainless steel, in those cases, you follow the vent manufacturer's recommendations. So important things to kind of get out of the way before we get started on here. But without any more, let's kind of jump into the presentation we've got. If you do have some questions, throw them down here in the chat. You should see a little chat window. Um, and I'll do my best to make sure I get those answered as we're, uh, as we're going along today. All right. So without much more yammering from me, let's go ahead and take a look at our presentation today. All right. So venting do's and don'ts. And these are just some things that I've come across over the years on whether it be startups, installations, call-in questions from people, and things we've run into. So we're going to start with always the obvious. Make sure you vent the flue products outside of the build building. It's an interesting picture, and I like to use it. The reason I use this picture is not only is this a kind of a, a, a catastrophic venting failure, if you will, it was a communication failure. So this is back before the days of email and cell phones and everything else. And this, this customer called in for technical support because they couldn't get a good draft out of their, their appliance. It just wouldn't work right. You could see on the front of it, it's really burning and, and marking it there. And the conversation turned to, what's your draft over the fire? The guy who had it went out and bought a draft gauge and he had no draft over the fire. And they asked him, hey, can you go take your, uh, your draft three feet up? So he at that point in time, went out and bought this piece of pipe you see on it and took the draft three feet up. And he said, I still got nothing. That's when they asked him to take a picture and mail it to him. So back then you had to take a picture, put it in an envelope, mail it. Um, so this is that ultimate failure at reading the directions and venting the flu products outside of the building. All right. Follow your applicable codes. Every state Commonwealth, whatever it is, has their own code or what they've adopted. Here in Massachusetts, they've adopted NFPA 54, but then they amend NFPA 54. So there's going to be a book of amendments that will go with it. New York has its own code. Um, some follow the uniform mechanical code. Everybody's different. So make sure that you're following your applicable code and the inspector is going to have the final say as to what's going on. And that's referenced in the code as the authority having jurisdiction. So that becomes really important that the gas inspector at the end of the day is the final say on what, what happens um, and what goes on. Massachusetts and New York City right here have modifications um, going on. Um, so if you're in either of those areas, right now PVC in New York City is completely out. 
uh, Massachusetts, it's been voted on. Um, it's been adopted by the Commonwealth, and right now they are waiting on it to be put into the uh, basically the the code of register there. Once that happens, um, you'll no longer be allowed to use PVC as a vent material. <clears throat> All right, what are we talking about? When we talk about those things. Direct vent appliances. Terminology is really really important here. Okay, and it, you it means you're getting your air directly from the outdoors. Question I put posed to you here, and we talk about it is: Is a boiler on room air a direct vent appliance? And the answer to that question is no, and that's important to know. If you put a boiler in, it's a two pipe system, and you take your air from the inside, you have to follow um, the local code on a mechanical draft piece of equipment. All right, and that's kind of going to be your fan assisted combustion appliance. And this talks about how we either draw or force. Um, products through the combustion chamber heat exchanger. And just a, a little more to that when we start talking about the vent material drops into these categories. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but when you're in a category four vented appliance, generally you're in those plastic products is what you're going to use. And you get that condensation and positive pressure. So that's what this looks at here. You know, category three, positive pressure, but doesn't condensate. Um, in there. And so in category three appliances, we might find ourselves in the B vents and those sort of things. Um, probably some stainless steel vent materials there. Um, you get into these non-positive vent. Now they're not as concerned of the pressure causing flue gases to leak out. And go here again, non-positive um, and not condensating. So that's, you know, one, two, and three. So one, that's your old style. And I just put, you know, some sheet metal galvanized pipe on it. Uh, category four, uh, what we talk about most nowadays, that's all your high efficiency equipment. And just a little quick kind of picture. Natural draft, I'm using the, the draft to pull it in. I need to be airtight because I'm pressurized on these sides here and I'm concerned about pushing out and leaking flue gases. All of these will have some sort of sealing system in your vent material, whether that's gaskets, usually here in the category three, um, can be ca gaskets, and down here, we're gonna get into the glued fittings when we're on this side. So that's what they're looking for when I'm creating that positive pressure, concerned with pushing flue gases into the space. Couple of don'ts, um, don't do that. And you know what to say other than don't do that. Um, and in this case here, it's the wrong vent material for the product. So where have you been already? Where have you been? Just on. All right, so mechanical draft. Now this is really talking about when we've got a fan pushing, but we're really taking sometimes air from the space and that's where we're no longer direct vent. So we're gonna have to follow some of that stuff right there. And you could either push the flue gases, um, you're forced or you could pull and it's an induced. So you'll hear people refer to it as an induced draft system or a force draft. It's the same thing, we put the fan on a different side of the, of the fire. All right, so now let's get to direct vent appliance to talk about that. So direct vent appliances are gonna, and here's where it talks about manufacturer's installation instructions. And that's what you're gonna be looking at. So each manufacturer is gonna produce the installation instructions, there's gonna be a set of drawings. So what I, what I wanna point out here is, in this drawing for this particular boiler, it shows that I can be 12 inches from a window if I'm a direct vent. If I now take my air from inside the house, I actually come over to here, and now I have a four foot minimum um, from that to be away from the window. So it changes it when I went to mechanical draft, because I was no longer taking the air from outside, once I'm taking it from inside, the concern being is when I'm taking it from the outside, I'm balanced. The air that I'm using inside that's going out the chimney is coming in the side. When I pivot over to this scenario, now the air that I'm using inside the house, if I'm not drawing it in, I have to get that fenestration air or the leakage. And if I open that window, am I gonna pull potentially the flue gases back in. So it's getting enough distance now for dilution. 
So it, again, talks about that mechanical drift is at four feet away. All right, so just make sure that you're, you're keeping track of that. And then when they talk about this 12 inches above finished ground level, they also will factor here in New England and the snow line's gonna come into play for that. All right, just a, some pictures and some examples of where the code talks about it and where these things come from. So in 1293, that's the one that says that a direct vent appliance can be you know, 12 inches away. And it really gets into the BTU um, output of the appliance. So 50,000 BTU and above 12 inches, there's actually a point in time where it's gonna move us to 36 inches and it's gonna move us to 48 inches. Plastic piping, important right here, primer and glue. Make sure that you're using that and you're using the right stuff. Um, it, it's really important that your primer softens that glue and because it's creating a chemical weld when you glue fittings. So it's definitely making sure that you're doing that appropriately. Um, primer and glue. If you don't, you're gonna have it come apart on you. And you can see that they do require primer to be of a contrasting color. Plastic joints, look for leaks. Um, a, one that's not glued it appropriately is gonna have a leak if uh, condensate, and if it's got a leak of condensate, it's got a leak of flue gases. All right, so let's get into a little bit on special gas vans, and this is where I mentioned that earlier. Specific really to polypropylene and stainless steel venting, um, there's a UL1738 PVC out there now. It's going to fall into this category. <clears throat> when a gas vent manufacturer creates a product and gets it approved, it gets a UL approval, whether that's 1738, maybe it's ULC 636, part of the approval process is the way that it goes together. So they're going to issue, these are my installation instructions. This is how you're going to put it together. This is how you're going to support it. This is what you're going to do. And all of that gives it its UL approval, thereby allowing it to be installed on your appliance. So make sure you're following the directions is, is definitely important on those products. Appliance adapters, I kind of pointed those out here. When you're using the polypropylene, the outer wall of the polypropylene doesn't match the outer wall of maybe a CPVC or a PVC. And that's why they have an appliance adapters. We do run into it from time to time where somebody's just gone right into it and you get leaking of condensation and flue gases around there. Also run into it with stainless steel vent materials where the wall of the stainless steel manufacturers aren't all the same size. You have the same thing. You can have some leaking around that outside. So there's different gasketing. It's important to know. <clears throat> if, you have a, if you're on a job site, and you think you've got sometimes some leaking around some stainless steel venting and you're seeing water. One of the things to look for is this right here. Take a look at that. If I've got a double wall stainless fitting, I'm in a mechanical room that might be a little on the cool or the colder side and I don't seal tight here, some of that flue gas is coming out, hits that, that wall of that stainless steel vent and actually condenses on it. Sometimes we, and then as it runs down, we think we have a leak in the, uh, in the boiler or something along those lines. And you can see actually here in this case, they were getting a little bit of that. And there's just a little evidence of where that condensation was then basically coming out as a gas, turning into a liquid, dripping back down onto it. Don't mix your systems. That's a, that's a code requirement. NFPA 54 says don't mix your systems. Um, in this case, they thought they were kind of doing right, and the, the appliance manufacturer supplies this CPVC starter piece. And really, instead of just taking that out and going straight to here with the stainless steel, they use that. You actually create a couple more fittings in there than you need, or connections. Um, and expansion and contraction of the products is definitely going to be different. So you, you don't want to mix your systems. Here, this is just other than terrible. Oops. On that one, not really sure what else to kind of say for it. They just really stuffed it in there and glued it um, with RTV sealant. So the chances of that, you know, causing a, a leak of flue gases is actually pretty high. Um, and they did, did it on 25 boilers in this um, complex. And in this case, this is the attic here. So the, the problem is, is obviously, you know, the, the carbon monoxide wants to drop. So we're starting at the highest point in the building and then allowing it to drop down through the, through the apartments. 
Scent lengths. Scent lengths are important and important to understand. Um, and again, this is different on, on, on levels for each boiler manufacturer. As a rule of thumb, um, a 90 is, is five feet. Um, it's with most of our manufacturers that are out there today, go with that rule of thumb. So in this case, 50 feet of pipe, 790s, 35 feet of PEL. When I kind of had that camera on it, maybe before, right next to me is an LTI tankless water heater. They actually limit the number of 90s you can use. So they have a TEL limit as well as a number of 90. So it's important that you keep both of those um, in mind as you're putting your vent system together. And what ends up happening, depending on the type of appliance, when you start to get to these, these ends is, you know, some that can be a D-rate. Um, sometimes you're going to get flame failure issues, um, lockouts like that. There are products that say 100 feet and eh, you go 105 feet, you're okay. There's products that say 100 feet and you go 100 feet, one inches, and you're not okay. So sticking to those um, vent lengths is important. How about unbalanced lengths? Now I'm going to talk basically just for lock and bar only because that's the product we represent. This is a manufacturer by manufacturer rule. Okay. So in, in, in lock and bar's world, as long as your vent longer than your air, they're going to allow it. And generally they want the vent going up through the, uh, through the roof and the intake through the sidewall is their preferred method. There is what they like to, they like to see when you're going to unbalance those lengths. One of the things that's almost a never allowed is two different sidewalls as far as kind of front of the house, back of the house. They don't allow that. Um, that doesn't work well at all. Also, the other thing is taking your air from the roof and then taking your exhaust out the sidewall. Just another thing that we start to go against the laws of physics. Think about natural chimney draft. That natural chimney draft wants to go up. So if I try to take my air from the roof and exhaust out the sidewall, I'm fighting that natural buoyancy and I'm fighting that natural thing. And it's going to put additional resistance on what I have going on in my, in my boiler. Terminations. Again, you got to get to the manufacturers. What are they approving? Because they're testing them and that becomes the thing. Now they'll many times say, Hey, we approve you to use this with this stainless steel product and this stainless steel manufacturer and put it in whatever they tell you to do. Follow their directions and their approvals. And then you're good to go on that. If it's a plastic vent, a PVC, CPVC, for those of you that are outside of Massachusetts or New York using PVC, at that point in time, you, you're following whatever the manufacturer tells you. The manufacturer tells you to use this termination kit because we've listed it with our appliance. That's the one that you have to use. In this case here, this is, it was an interesting conversation with an inspector. Now this termination kit is almost identical to the manufacturers of the appliance, but it's not the one that they listed. So it technically is not approved. So you can run into that with the inspector saying, Hey, does this have approval um, in there? And you're not going to find it in the manual and they're going to reject your, your installation. So it's definitely something to look for. And sometimes that's a nitpicky, thing you know does it does it truly affect the performance of the product it probably doesn't but when we get into ul listing we get into manufacturer's approval and then we get into flue gases flue gases being probably the most dangerous thing we're going to run across with any of these appliances with carbon monoxide and those sort of things all those listings all those approvals all that stuff that's protecting you as a contractor that you put it in the way they said to do it and what they said the minute you say, well, I really like this termination kit from this other manufacturer, you unpeeled that UL label um, and you kind of changed the, the scenario there. So definitely things that you want to kind of watch out for and maybe shy away from. This one's a huge one. Gas meters. Um, we <clears throat> and our, our, our guys out in the field, Jerry, our service manager and, and Mike and Tom, they probably argue this point more than I would say almost any other point that's out there. No more than four feet horizontally from an electric meter, gas meter, regulator, relief valve, never above those or below those within four feet horizontally. 
the thing is, is you want to keep the condensation off of those appliance, those different things. If you put a exhaust of a boiler, condensing boiler, as you see in this picture here, above a gas meter, condensate is, is water. And it's going to land on the meter, and it's going to get it wet. Or if you get it up high enough and you build one of those icicles and you drop it off on the gas meter. Definitely something to watch watch out for. There's a lot of argument as to whether it's a four foot radius around the meter. It's interpreted that way sometimes. Generally, it's interpreted as a four foot radius side to side from the meter and nothing directly above the meter. And the, the drawing in NFPA 54 will show you that. Never be directly above a, a, a gas meter. How about this one here? And just so you guys know, I'm setting you up with this picture because in there you're looking at it and say, hey man, that looks all right. It's not bad, it's pretty close to this here. And one of the things our startup guys ask for um, is pictures. Hey, send me a picture before I come out and start it up. I wanna make sure it's vented right. And if you got this picture, you'd probably say, yeah, that, that looks okay. But if you looked at it from this angle, you'd probably say, maybe not so much. Um, and, it, and it's a tough one. You know, people don't wanna see it. Um, we run out of spaces to put it. And so you're gonna get into a problem here of flue gas recirculation. And that's one of the things they're gonna talk about in NFPA and in the manuals, not to do these, these sort of things. And, and it's tough, you gotta fight the homeowner sometimes uh, over what they think. And you know, do you snorkel it up above it, but then you gotta watch you out just almost out of view is a window. So a lot of stuff to, to look for. And just to spend a minute on this picture, I was involved uh, several years ago so my, my role in, in, our, in our company is unique. They, they, I'm a terrible salesman, so they try not to let me do anything like that. But I think generally they figure out if people are angry, I can't make them any angrier, so go ahead and send me out. So I went and met a homeowner on a job one day in the contractor, and they were upset, wanted their boiler removed because it just wouldn't stay running. Two and a half year old boiler, couldn't keep it running. They'd been having problems for about a year. I talked to the uh, homeowner, you know, just, they were happy and then couldn't keep it running. As we walk around the back, they had almost this identical situation right here. And what was happening is when the boiler would run, it would recirculate the flue gases until it shut down. When the service technician would show up, the air had cleared out, he could reset it and it would take right off and run. And being a good service technician, he spun the wheel of parts that he carries in his van to decide which party should replace. And after a three or $4,000 investment in parts and everything else, we got invited out there and we said, I think this is our problem. And what we did was we actually just on the site right then and there had them move the exhaust out away from behind the bush and all the problems were resolved. So sometimes it's as simple as that and you could end up chasing it with service calls and all sorts of things. So that's one of that, yep, the customer was happy because they couldn't see it. And in this case, the boiler had been up and running for about a year and a half and the homeowner got tired of looking at the vent and they planted the bush in front of the vent to create the issue. So it became really easy when you said to them, hey, when'd you put the bush there? And they're like, oh, it was about a year ago, right about the time their problem started. So self-inflicted. They still didn't want to pay the contractor the repair bill, but uh, you know, so just things to, to look for. That venting is always something that can bite you in the rear end. This one here, um, nothing good you could say about this at all. There's no part of it that was done correctly. And this, this sort of goes sometimes as an industry, I, I blame ourselves for this. Um, contractor, you know, asked me to come out and visit him on this site. Um, he was, he was on a boiler that had been stalled about a year. They were having issues with it. As we walked into the house, there was another boiler that had been installed for years that had failed and had issues with it. They hadn't even gotten it out of the house. They just hung the new one on the wall. And when they hung the new one on the wall, they just tied into this piping and left it there. So if we talked about the trifecta of how you could actually screw up venting a boiler, I think they got every single part of it um, in here wrong. And the, the contractor who was there didn't install it. He's actually a good friend of mine. And uh, when I went to take the pictures, he ran away um and hit just to make sure i didn't have him in my uh in my picture with it but you know aside from our flue gas recirculation within the six feet of the corner 
And, and if you look at this, this is in the code. You know, you can't reuse the venting system, the corrosion, the deficiencies. Look, look at all the other problems that exist with that venting already. So there was just nothing that, that, that was really done right. And the last thing the contractor who was there to service it did before he left was to call the plumbing inspector to come um, and meet him on the site because he was now concerned that he was the last guy touching it. Let's take a look at this one here. I like this one, one that's a beautiful ocean view as we're looking past it. This is a great install. It's a contractor did a nice job, really just a solid contractor and they were, but they were chasing some issues. Um, and we get out there and you look at it, and you're like, ah, everything's really good. We went down and we were finding water um, into the air intake. But what you don't see is they had a sprinkler system installed. And there's a sprinkler right there that's launching right up into that air intake. So beautiful job by a contractor. And he was, you know, tripped up by a, a, a landscaper who put the, the sprinkler right there. And so there's always other issues, other things. But again, it's, it's a venting thing to look at. Hit every every one of his boxes. What he was supposed to do, you know, he's up above the snow line. He's away from the corner. He's got them together. It's per the manual. Everything else, and then somebody puts the sprinkler in. And sometimes you just can't win. Let's talk about the effects of venting issues. Uh, just so you guys know, they are not social distancing in this picture. And one of the things is is noise. So I, I do get called out on jobs where, where noise, and as we transition as an industry to the fire tube boilers from the water tube, fire tube boilers have higher static pressures to get through them, which means we have higher static pressure fans. Those fans tend to make a little more noise. The noise is directional, though. This is important, okay? So think about where you aim the vent. Now, just you know, now this isn't, I was not invited to the party, unfortunately, to listen to the, to the noise here. But many times we, we can go to one of those sites and you take and you turn that exhaust 45 degrees and the noise goes away. Um, for those of you that are in areas where the housing is very tight together, so in the greater Boston area, we have uh, Brookline and Cambridge, and you might have 10 or 11 feet in between houses. And if you exhaust and you aim right at the neighbor's house, the neighbor is going to call and complain. So, you know, we talk about, hey, put a 45 on it, put a 22, whatever you're doing, angle it here, something along those lines, and just reposition it so it's not aimed right at the neighbor's house and you're not getting that echoing and those sort of things and eliminates those noise calls. Um, so just some, some things that you can do to make your life a little easier and get yourself invited to the hot tub party. Um, but some other things, hard starts and combustion issues can be over length venting. So we talked a little bit about that too many elbows um, going long. So if my, my boiler's having a hard time um, getting started at the beginning when I initially you know try and pull that draft because I'm supposed to go 100 feet, no more than 100 and I went 110 or I went 115. Um, we see those as these stutters at the beginning. Remember that these are fan driven and they're negative regulation um, for their gas off. So that air that they're pulling is drawing the gas in. Well, if I'm having a hard time pulling that air in there and pushing it out through my vent, that's gonna push back on my combustion. And I'm gonna get these, these bangs and, and you know the, the combustion issues like that. The other thing I can run into, and this actually here, this was actually a decent install by really good contractor. So I'm hoping he's not seeing that I'm using this picture because it's not a bad install. But I wanted to talk right here. See, I have a fitting into a fitting. In this case, it's not bad. He was really smart. He used a couple of 45s as he moved through there. When you're coming right off the appliance, if you can avoid compound fittings, especially street 90s, when you're coming right off of there, you create a lot of restriction right at the start. So as my boiler goes to light and I got that little, you know, basically explosion of, of, of fire in there, but it's hard to get out. I get stuck in that boiler and I can get a little back pressure. So if you can get a little piece of pipe or you know, put one fitting, a little piece of pipe, another fitting, 45s, it's a great way to just get a smoother light off in your boiler, a little smoother operation in those sites. So compound fittings, good thing to avoid if you can. So this one here, um, a lot of things that, that can go on here. It's very similar to that bush. 
behind the bush. So here's my exhaust. Here's my intake. I'm tucked in the corner. I'm behind the, the condenser unit. So I'm going to recirculate my flue gases. And so when I have that flame failure ignition and my you know, service technician goes out and he does what every good service technician does and he hits the reset button, that boiler is going to light or the furnace or whatever it is, is going to light because that dirty air is gone. Um, and it's going to just be this cycle as his um, burner gets dirty. Um, and, you know, you can have component failures coming from that. So those are things that you want to, you want to watch for. <clears throat> the other thing that to, to kind of look out for is, so flue gas is corrosive. And as this flue grass lands on the top of this, you know, train compressor or condenser out there, guess what? He's going to stop a train. So, you know, be something where we'd want to raise these up. If this is your application, there are a lot of different resolutions potentially that could have gone to it, bringing it out here to the front, getting it around the, the unit, getting something up. A lot of things that could have been looked at. This wasn't a catastrophic problem, you know, to start in here. And there were a lot of things that could have been done to kind of get out there a little better. But sometimes what happens is, and in this case, I'll bet it was, our HVAC contractor probably put the boiler in, the plumber probably piped this up, and then somebody came by and dropped the condenser right in front of his, uh, his pipes. Things to look at, contamination from dryer vents, getting drawn in here. Now there's two things in here, this is why this picture's here. One is this one here, this is your exhaust. Here's your intake. Um, so instead of having this come straight out like it should, we're actually pushing it down. So we're going to push the exhaust down, probably right into the intake of the boiler itself. And that's a reason for that separation. So although it doesn't seem like a big deal to put a 45 on there, can create that flue gas recirculation. Also, what we're finding is the chemicals in dryer sheets. Um, a lot of the Venturis are plastic they don't like the different chemicals that are in there. And it's interesting, you would think that, you know, bleach would be what we'd worry about. And, you know, we're not really seeing too much bleach coming out of the dryers, but it's like the Febreze, it's those perfumes and those chemicals end up being corrosive to the, uh, the plastic Venturi. So again, look for clearance to those uh, dryer vents. This guy here, um, not, a, not a problem, it's vented correctly. Um, other than the fact that just out of view here, um, you can actually almost see it right there, is a deck off of this very expensive condo. And this person had to come out and that was the view they got. And even at my house, I have um, basically combined, I have 100,000 BTUs in there. I vent around the corner from the living room window. My boiler's been doing that for seven years. And still on occasion, my wife thinks the side of the house is on fire because she looks out the window and you know, there goes the plume of steam uh, going by. So just, you know, things to, things to keep in mind. Um, how about questions? Anybody have any questions? I've been rambling on for an awful, awful long time. I didn't see anything in the chat. Anybody got anything? You can unmute yourself if you want to ask a, a question. Nothing. Look, I did an outstanding job today. Or you guys are all asleep. Although I see Lyle is not asleep because I can see Lyle, so. Other than that, I don't know that I can see too many of you guys. Bob keeps moving around. Um, so, you know, like really at the end of the day, the thing is check, read the manual. Reading the manual is important. Don't assume that because you've always put in brand, and I, I get the question a lot. Hey, I put in this brand boiler. I've been putting it in for 15 years. It says I can vent it this way. Now I went over to this other brand. Why can't I? They use the same heat exchanger. The simple answer to that is they didn't have it tested for that termination or, that, or whatever it is. And, and that may be it. It may work, but it's not tested and approved um, for, for that scenario. And that's what you want to make sure of. And that's sort of covering yourself as the installing contractor. There's no spot where we probably face greater liability on the, on the plumbing and heating world than probably venting a gas-fired appliance um, and, and having those flue gases kind of come back in there. Um, <clears throat> so if nobody's got any other, uh, any questions. I guess venting's pretty simple. I appreciate you guys taking the, uh, the time today to, 
to, to hang out here and I will be sending a follow up with just a little bit of information. I'm gonna send you guys a copy of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, the, uh, the slides of it. And if you think of anything later on, feel free to go ahead and uh, just shoot me an email. And if not, that is it for today. And if uh, tomorrow we're gonna be doing some stuff on venting specifically with Centratherm. Those will be on the, on the docket for tomorrow. Um, so if you have questions about that, jump in tomorrow and join us for those. All right. So without further ado, thank you guys very much and look forward to seeing you another time here in the, in the future.